Hello, Patrick. Thank you so much for being on the show with me. Thank you so much, Michelle, for inviting me. Yeah, we're going to have an amazing conversation. I'm really excited for everyone listening because the insights that you have on innovation and technology, specifically in the field of innovation, um, are not just interesting, but so relevant and grounded in academ academia or academics and this idea of teaching and learning um, as much as they are in the ed tech and emerging technology spaces. So it's going to be a real treat to get your perspective. I always like to start, though, Patrick, by asking folks about, because education, experiencing the system of education can do some damage to people, you know? Like, not all of us come out of higher education or post-secondary education or high school. I didn't come out of ele elementary school unscathed, Patrick, uh, so I always like to ask my guests their experience with the system of education as a young person coming up. Like, did you always like school? Was was school this thing that you felt was foreign and unnecessary? Or what was your relationship to the formal education system as you experienced it? Yeah, it was. Um, uh, I, I didn't really enjoy school itself. I enjoyed being at school because I was around a lot of, of good people. Uh, and and I'm not talking about partying here. I'm I'm, I'm talking really uh, doing work, but uh, things I was involved in, for example, in in high school, um, uh, was a computer club. For example, I was in the computer club. I was also in the theater club. Uh, so I, I had this mix of doing arts and computers, and um, uh, and I I, I get different um vibes if you want from people because i was in these two separate things i was also in sports i was uh i played football um so you know it, it's all a variety of people and i had the chance to be with this variety of people at all times and learning things in fact i think i learned more from people than i actually did from teachers um because the structure at least from what i remember was very very square you, you know you had to learn the stuff from chapter one chapter two you had social studies physics and and i understand the the stem type courses those are are, are going to be square i mean math is math you, you're not you're gonna not gonna change that but but my interest was was more in um creativity and what to do and that's what i loved about being uh, with computers especially back then we're thinking we're talking 1983, 84, 85. Um, I, I had a computer, an Apple II Plus, uh, at the age of 10. They had just come out. This was not a thing at the time, right? So um, um, so I learned on that. and uh, But I was very interested in the creativity, creativity of it. So building programs, for example. Uh, you have to realize that when we had this Apple II, nothing existed. Uh, and I remember my dad, he, he, he purchased this thing for my brother and I. And, um, but there, was, there were no diskettes, nothing. Uh, you had a tape recorder, uh, again, with nothing on it, just a blank cassette. And uh, so we asked our dad, I was like, okay, well, what do we do with it? And he slaps down a book on programming and off we went. My brother and I just started learning to program that way. And of course, it has evolved since, but it hasn't changed all that much. But the logic is still the same, right? So, so that's really uh, interesting to, because I know you as a colleague as well, working with you. You know, you've had a long tenure at York University before that at the University of Alberta. Our paths crossed at the at York, and and correct. we can talk more about our our work later. But. I know you as a person whose brain works in lots of really interesting different ways. And what you just talked about was as a young child, you were already the kind of person who didn't mind a blank page. You know, you liked the idea of being creative and populating empty space and not understanding what this computer could do, but figuring it out and programming things from scratch. So there's that curiosity and, and creativity that you have inside of you, but you were also able to perform in the more linear, siloed, yeah. complete this test, A plus B equals C type of work exactly. environment. 
Did you feel yeah. as a child that you resonated in both of those spaces that you could see that, oh, I'm good at this more rote, structured kind of learning. I can do this. I don't find it as interesting, but I'm good over here. But I also have this ability to be free and unconstrained over here because those two characteristics don't usually live in the same person with as much harmony as you're articulating. Yeah, and and, and I I gotta admit I'm way better on the creative part. Like, let me go and 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 do things uh, than the the traditional uh, learning. Not that I can't do. It. Obviously, I can. Uh, uh, I even went and uh, at one point in my career uh, needed to have a uh, what was called the Microsoft Certified System Engineer papers, and uh, I went and did that in two weeks. And you know, it's uh, most people take a year to do it. So I can do it. And and it's not to say that I went in with no knowledge and did it in two weeks. I I built my knowledge around using the systems, learning about them. And this is back when uh, Windows was in the Windows 95, 98 era. Oh, that was like and, the first one. That was like the first one I enjoyed. Yeah. So exactly. And 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 uh, Windows NT and Windows 2000 were, uh, 2000 was on the verge of coming out. I had access because I was working at the University of Alberta at that time. I had access to early releases of Windows 2000. So I was playing around with them. And, um, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm like, well, wait a second. I I need to get a paper on this. I, I, I need to prove that I know how to use this stuff, not just knowing, but proving, right? And, and so... I went and got the paper and I did it in two weeks and I, yeah. you know, it's, I can't do it, but it's not, it's not what I like doing. <laughs> it's what, what I like doing is learning based on projects. You know that, I mean, when we work together, it's always a project that I want to do and, and, and that makes it advance. And right now, uh, you know, I'm working on a course assistant project and we're, we're using IBM. E.M. Watson, and we've started just last week working with ChatGPT or GPT uh, uh, three technology, right? Yes, so, we're going to pin it for um, a second. We're going to talk more about the specific technology. Yeah, so. I just want to double click for a second, still on like Young Patrick, because Young Patrick, being someone who is excelling at certain STEM fields, but also this urge to create and work on projects. Where is that that kind of learning, as we know in the professional sector as well, individual teachers, individual employees, individual students like yourself in that high school phase, need support to be creative in those spaces because they are often disruptive, they're unclear, they're not linear necessarily. And when we face frustrations, like we like something doesn't work, and then we need to problem solve and figure out how it works. That experimentation process in a world that often can be quite punitive and focus on the negatives of failure versus success, how did young Patrick feel supported to explore and be creative? I think you mentioned, you know, your father, was he a, a strong voice of support for you in this in this space? And then you also mentioned um, school colleagues, like peers. Yeah. Um, who are also exactly. important. Maybe just ex expand on that for me for a bit. Yeah. So, so uh, my father was absolutely supportive. Uh, uh, he he's the one uh, who uh, introduced us to, to to computers. He saw it as a future, and therefore wanted us to be uh, introduced to that at a very early age. And uh, but at school, it was peers, but it was also two two teachers in particular that were um that that made the whole difference one was my drama teacher uh and the other one was a computer teacher uh, uh -huh. and math teacher right? uh, um because i know this is odd and we're talking back in the 80s when there wasn't a lot i mean the internet was not a thing it existed but it what it wasn't a thing no one had that uh we had um, I remember when we first had uh, a modem come come into the school. The 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 teacher didn't even know how to use it, but we got together to learn how to use the darn thing and go into these bulletin boards, for example, right? Uh, so so a lot of this learning was done 
by the teacher. The teacher was learning as I was learning too. And, and it was, it was that kind of relationship. And I didn't feel, although there was a teacher student relationship, but you know, after class, I found I was a friend with the teacher too. Obviously we didn't hang out, but, but it was fun. It was, and and there was no judgment. That was the biggest thing. And same thing with my, my drama teacher, there was zero judgment, whatever I did or anyone did in, in that class, she just let it go. Yeah, go for it, go for it. And a lot of encouragement. And I brought that, whatever I was doing in drama to the computer room, especially after class class was very formal right you 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 have to do turtle graphics for example yeah you had to do the the little program that was part of the exercises but after class the 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 computer club and listen computer club is really a word there were three of us (laughs) it's like it's not like it was a bunch of students here it was the teacher plus two other students one being me and 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 another friend (laughs) so this is really interesting because what you're talking about now i think is really relevant in the way people are approaching teaching and learning because the world what you're talking about this like emergent technology literally the internet didn't exist to the internet begins to exist to these these this the 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 personal pc is is becoming more ubiquitous now we would talk about digital technologies the phones what you described are teachers who are willing to experiment with students. This idea of, I don't know all the answers. I don't need to know all the answers. The point is not that I have all the answers. The point is that I'm here with you, right? We're talking, we're engaging, we're we're co-discovering. I'm going to facilitate. I'm holding a presence. I'm designing a lesson where we have... um, kind of structured explorations, debriefs, reflections, all of those good things that teachers are taught to have in their lessons. But there's this freedom to experiment and explore and and that be in and of itself the objective, that the objective is not, that like the, the outcome you're looking for as a teacher is not that they become perfect in something because no one is perfect at it because it's all still evolving and changing. We live in a world where everything is changing and evolving so quickly. And it and the lesson learned from your experiences, it might be serving our students better if we weren't looking to ourselves to have all the answers and we weren't scared to introduce certain types of technology into our educational spaces so that we could explore them together and learn together at the same time. Yeah, and, and that's the thing too, like even in my position now, I never, I never, although I, I have expertise in systems, uh, I never actually use that as power, if you want, you know, like I, I always play dumb around everyone um, in, in my team because um, I can learn from it too. Like it, it, even if the system I, 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 I'm uh, an expert in, I hate using that word, but the one I, I, I I know very well is the learning management system called Moodle. We use that here at York. I've been using it since uh, 2004, uh, and they had just come out uh, in that time. But um, but even if that's the case, and and I'm I mean people call me from other universities for help with their installations and their uses and and how they can put in certain features and and, and so on. But even at that, I I I I remain very humble because uh, there's always something I learn. Every week I learn something new, right? Uh, and and if you have the mentality that I'm the best, I'm I I know this better than anyone, you're not going to be able to learn anything new. And I I, I never believe that. Um, uh, yeah, stay humble. Even if you're the expert, stay humble. Even when you're. Patrick, who is the 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 Moodle expert with you know almost twenty years of experience in the software, no, and what you're talking about too is evidence in your, evident in your conversation about how you grew up. Like you have a mindset, a certain way of thinking, a certain way of approaching problems, one that is curious, one that is collective, where you value community, and that you understand things are a process that they don't end. This really leads me to this idea of innovation and the definition of it, because I think we're defining innovation here um, 
to a certain extent, a shared uh, definition that that we've cultivated through our work together. And also just during this conversation, this idea of being open, being curious, being creative with what's available and how you might use tools that are available. And they may have been used one way, but they could be used another way. <laughs> a question I have for you around innovation is specifically technological. So those are certain innovation behaviors, certain innovation traits that you would have as a person. What is, what are you looking for, Patrick, when something, because I know you, you get shown new and emergent technology, you're constantly looking uh, at things that are coming out in the world. What is the criteria by which you measure how innovative a piece of technology is, whether it's a software, a hardware, what does it mean to you that a, a piece of technology is innovative? So I, I look at it as um, how flexible is it going to be? Because uh, um, e even if I look back at the way I use Moodle, for example, uh, Moodle is a learning management system. But to me, it's more than that. I, I can do anything with it. Uh, and and there's a lot of projects that I do. The back end is Moodle. No one has a clue it's Moodle because um, I learned that I can do. It's flexible. It I can do whatever I want with it. I look for technologies that are like that, and there's a lot of it out there. Um, uh, and if we want to talk flexibility, let, let's talk about uh, OpenAI, for example. Yeah. I know we're going to get there. Everyone wants to hear about all the AI conversations because you are my AI guru. Yeah. Um, but flexibility is really interesting. And then I also want to touch on another point because this is a word that everybody, all teachers and uh, um, educators are concerned with. And often technologists can be blamed for not considering it as often, um, which is the term accessibility. Yeah which is this idea of equity and accessibility. And I just want to know where that conversation, I would imagine that conversation has changed over time that, you know, the emphasis in the eighties or nineties or early two thousands around equity, diversity, and inclusion and what that meant in the technological space could have been very one dimensional. And maybe now yeah. there's more a nuanced approach to, to EDI. Talk to us a bit about, innovation and technology and accessibility. Yeah, so so if I go back to very, very early times in my career, uh, I remember thinking, how, especially when I was at, at university, before university, um, and I'm talking working at a university and having to uh, deliver courses to those that could not make it in person. And we're talking back 1997 era. So the internet was out, but it wasn't a thing yet. Uh, you know, it, it was still fairly new and and not everyone had emails and forget chats and all that stuff. That, that just wasn't a thing other than bulletin board types, uh, forums, if you want. But um, but even at that that time, um, there were there were distance courses and they were done with phones, for example, right? And, we, and I remember in the in our server room, we had this big appliance where, if you can imagine, a, a switchboard where you plug in cables so that people can communicate together in, 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 at a distance, right? And and so there was always that, that, to me, was always that need for accessibility. And when we went towards the internet, so we're talking... 2003, 2004, um, again, not everyone had that. And most people had modems. And today, kids today are from like, what's a modem? Um, <laughs> I, we're talking very low speeds. If you understand internet speeds, we're talking maximum fix 56 bits. <laughs> we're now in like, at home, I have 1.5 gigs. <laughs> of internet access, right? Um, we're talking 56 kilobits of internet access. It is puny. Um, so it, at a very, very early stage, I started developing uh, tools that could allow 
people to download. And I know this sounds weird because, well, download, you do that every day today. Yeah, but back then it wasn't a thing, <laughs> right? Um, and even caching as we know it today, uh, and that I'm getting technical now, but that didn't exist <laughs> back then. So how do we get people who do not have in a good internet access or limited internet access, the material that, that they need. So accessibility, I know today there's a lot of, of uh, talk about accessibility in that, um, you know, uh, colorblind and, and uh, 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 um, people with, I um, um, forget the term, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the dyslexia, uh, right? We're, we're, we're working on that. But before before all of that, there was just accessibility to the material itself. Well, even now we have and, that same discussion around broadband, right? So now it's not the modem and dial-up, but that same conversation has 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 persisted. Absolutely. Is there, a, like, is there a solution that you've envisioned, Patrick, in terms of this equity of access to broadband? I mean, I know it's it's a huge issue and obviously it's persisted since the early days of the internet, but it seems as if, I mean, there's so much literature in terms of the digital divide and the evolving nature of what the digital divide is. Um, even if there were a device and a broadband, there are still equity and access issues. But with the access to the internet specifically, do you feel because campuses, you know, have, you know, reliable internet, they have devices for loan. Are these the innovative concepts? I mean, besides, obviously, political shifts in outfitting rural areas and remote access, are these some of the innovations that we've had loaning equipment and providing access on campus? Yeah, absolutely. Th those are, are things. But even at that, we're, yeah. If I look at York, we're starting to get away from that because most people that come here already have devices. They may not all ha all have multiple devices, but they'll have at least one that can do the the job. And we're noticing a lot of students will have uh, um, um, iPads or some kind of of, of a tablet system more than 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 a computer, for example. Um, so. What's important in our innovation is making sure that this is all working on these tablets, regardless of the power of the tablet, right? So this comes back to what I was talking uh, before, like caching and uh, making sure that the files, uh, I don't know how many times I've seen uh, instructors put a picture that's a raw picture from their camera on their course page. Well, that's all great if you, you're at the university. It'll load in, in less than a second. But if you go on, on a pad with someone who doesn't have the high bandwidth that we have, it can take up to a minute to load these files because they're huge. So what one of the things we're doing, at least here, is showing people that, look, you can take the same image, compress it, like make it smaller, mm. and and change the the dots per inch again very technical here but but you there are so many things we can do a raw image will be at 300 or more dots per inch bring it down to 75 it's right. great for the visual very makes it a very small image but it doesn't print very well but yeah, it's not important that. it's for these considerations right? and this is what's so important like it's not so it's not, again, in the field of innovation, it's not about having the specific solution. It's about testing things, trying things, and having the conversations. And now these conversations around accessibility are, to your point, around compatibility. So you have a Samsung, This someone has a Google Android, someone has an iPad. How am I making yeah. sure that the central learning management system, Moodle is designed, and I don't know if this is the correct term, but an agnostic kind of way, where it can be used and loaded and the course material is accessible in that regard and not sacrificing elements of engagement, which might be a visual image. It might be a short video. How does one integrate those and educating? I know a big part of what we do together is trying to integrate instructors and technology so that instructors are more well-versed in terms of what are some of these barriers that are created, right? Like maybe they didn't know that the image that they took on their phone was going to be take so long to load in an iPad. Um, so knowledge dissemination and education, yeah. I know, is a big part of our work in innovation too. 
And, and even it, it's extremely important. And, and it's transferring that knowledge to the instructors, for example. Like you, you brought up a good point. I, I talked about images, but what about videos? Videos take up even more bandwidth, right? Um, so uh, there are ways to make it so it doesn't use as much bandwidth. And we, but we have to let instructors know uh, to use these tools because you can just upload the video uh, to to, uh, to 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 uh, Moodle, but if you use a platform like Echo three hundred and sixty or Panopto or even YouTube, now it's a streaming video. It takes up less bandwidth right. than a download because a download it has to download the whole darn thing. If you are only interested in the first five minutes of the video, but it's a one hour long video, it's still downloading the one hour long video if you just stick it up on the website if you put it on youtube it'll just stream that five minutes that you need so you know it's all different little things like that uh, it's the nuances and one of the projects that patrick and i focus on at york university is this idea of engaged pedagogy which is a term that we steal from uh, tim fawns at the medical college in edinburgh which is it's not technology first. It's not teaching first. It's the fact that teaching is now inherently technological. That we live in a digital age. So um, we are we're working together to try to bring instructors, academics, educators from across York University together with um, technologists like yourselves and other AI architects and learning technology service professionals. To, to have these conversations, but also we're interested in creating some centralized resources and structure around how courses get designed so that there's a learn, like imagine a really user-friendly design environment for instructors where these things pop up. So it's not, hey, we have to reach every single individual and, and invest all the resources in meeting people where they are. Let's create an interface on Moodle, a design interface that's really user-friendly where these things are like, hey, have you thought of this? Experiential learning opportunity, authentic assessment opportunity. Let's talk about the size of your video because that matters. Let's talk about technology and instructional integrity. These conversations happening in unison. One thing is that it is about pedagogy. It's not about technology, right? Uh, and that's that's the biggest issue with IT. At a university, I work with a lot of IT folks and uh, each faculty has their own IT directors and they all have their own vision. And a lot of it is based on IT tools. There are, are so many innovations out there as far as IT tools. Um, it, it, my head is spinning. There, there's so much going out, on out there. And a lot of it are trends. Uh, and you'll see that in anything, in music, in movies, there, there are trends. and People tend to follow these trends, but often I notice that these trends are not academically sound is, is a term I want to use. They're, they're a trend. Oh, it's cool. It's a, it's a new gadget. Let's use it. No. How is it going to serve academia? That's what I look at. And that's where a lot of IT people don't spend the time to talk to their uh, professors or students to find out what will work best for them. Like the number of requests I get to add in different tools uh, into either Moodle or even into classrooms is, is ridiculous. Um, and, and some have merit, but a lot of them are just a trend that's going on and people want to jump into that trend. Um, you got to it's never IT first. It's pedagogy, academics, and then how does IT help with that? And that's been my vision throughout my whole career. And uh, I guess that's why I'm here now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And how do they work together? It's this, you know, this idea of needing things to be A plus B as opposed to just being A, B. <laughs> like we, we don't have to worry. Um, it, it, there is this idea of, following the trends in academia as well. You know, this idea of, <clears throat> well, this is the cool new thing in teaching and learning. We got to do this cool new thing in teaching and learning. And so in both areas, there's this, there's a predisposition to go with the trends and move down that kind of sexy path. And in both areas, if we talk together, if we work together and say, here's a function or feature that educators are looking to have, 
and then talk to technologists and say, oh, well, this is a function or feature that we have available to us in the learning management system, or we could build it out, or we could partner with so on and so forth. One more question I want to ask, Patrick, before we dive into the specifics, because I know everyone's really interested in talking about specific technologies and getting your input on trends, these 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 famous trends we speak of. I'm following one, right? Right? (laughs) But you have had, sometimes I think about our generation and this ability to have experience. You, You take it a step further. You have professional experience that spans almost pre internet to today. Can yes. you tell us a bit of the story as you've observed it? Like this progression of digital technologies in our lives from the TV, the radio, to the internet, to the personal PC, to now all of the bells and whistles. Do you see any sort of threads that have taught that tie these innovations together? That what what is it that has created, you know, do you have any thoughts or on, on why this has exploded and, and, or how the, how we got to where we are given where we were? Boy, that's a great question. <laughs> I never actually sat down to think about that one. So think things have always changed. And, and, and the biggest, I, I think what makes us evolve even further with this technology is, is, is fear of the technology. Huh. If I go back to when I started, and I remember the first LMS, it wasn't even, uh, it wasn't a thing. It, it was not called a learning management system at the time. This is back in in, um, in 95, 96. There were some out there, uh, like Blackboard was out there. It, it, actually, it wasn't even Blackboard. It was WebCT, which was an open source system. And um, um, I, myself, and another uh, uh, professor had designed one, too, at the U of A. It, it was our own thing. And the, the only reason we had designed it is because we were in a French faculty in an English university. And... The English university part of U of A had WebCT, like I said, open source system, but it didn't support French. <laughs> and it was very complicated and, and not very, the, the UX for it was not very, very good. So we turned around and built our own. People loved it, but it was not maintainable, especially not by just two people. And at a conference, that's where I discovered Moodle. And this is in, in 2004, 2005. I, I discovered Moodle. And I'll always remember being at, the, it was in Vancouver. I think you know that city quite well. Um, I was at that conference and they're, I, I'm sitting there. They're learning about this Moodle that's just come out. And I go back to the hotel room. I call this the, the professor that I was working with. And say, listen, I think I found our solution. It's an open source product, but there's a whole community, blah, blah, blah. And the whole story. And I installed it on my laptop and started converting what we had built into Moodle. And this was in October, right in the middle of a session. And in December, I decided that's it. We're moving to Moodle. We can't maintain and we moved everything over. The fear people had of this change uh, was, I mean, they, they were freaking out. I mean, the, 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 the feedback I was getting was, was uh, very uh, almost threatening because <laughs> no, you can't take away our platform. Like, you know, it's like, but this is going to be better. Yeah. I, you know, I, I had to do a lot of convincing, but you know what? By the end of the winter session, they loved it. So you just articulated a process. So asking how we got to where we are b- based on where we were, it seems as if, to paraphrase, that there's curiosity is part of the reason. People are curious. And then there's a problem. Like you yeah. were in a faculty, uh, a French faculty and in English and, the, and, the, and the, the browser didn't support what you needed. So people get faced with a problem and they approach that problem with curiosity and they start to look at ways of solving the problem. That is one driver in terms of how the world has gotten to where it is. That idea of, oh, there's a problem. Let's get curious. 
the flip side of that process of innovation that just keeps perpetuating and getting us where we are today is that implementation fear cycle. So mm. something is wrong. Let's see if we can get curious about it. Okay, here's an idea. Share it with people. They freak out, which is still happens today with every time you introduce something different because human beings are not good with change. And I under, yeah. we all understand neurobiologically, you know, you know, all of us who work in faculty support services, we understand change is a is a is a neurobiological response you're scared for your survival when conditions shift so there is an instinct to want things to stay the same because it what's safe is what's known is what's safe so then exactly. you have this here try this and then i'm scared and then there's all this work that happens in terms of acclimatizing the fear mitigating the fear which again continues the process of innovation and we say, oh, well, actually, no, they do. Here's a valid concern. Here's another problem. Let's get curious about that. So problem, curiosity, in implementation, fear, iteration. We just articulated a whole process of innovation, um, which has gotten us from where we were in the 80s to where we are now. And what I'd love to do yeah. now is dive into some specific, some specifics around technology and use cases for our audience. That's just part one of this exciting conversation, my friends. Click on part two and continue with us on this important journey we like to call the education revolution.